Brachycephalic breeds are now some of the most popular pedigree breeds in the UK. In 2016, the Kennel Club registered nearly 40,000 French Bulldog, Pug and Bulldog puppies alone, a 136% increase over five years. It's now more crucial than ever that we work to ensure a healthy future for some of the nation's favourite pets. Since 2006, the Kennel Club and Breed Clubs have been working closely with Cambridge University and the research department investigating respiratory function in brachycephalic breeds. It's an incredibly complex issue as the health concerns have a multitude of contributing factors, from genetics to environment. So it's very important that this research continues to further our knowledge and understanding of these breeds. To me and anybody that loves a little pug, they are really cute. They're really monkey-like, human-like, they have little personalities. Look at that little face. <laughs> How can you not love that? That's so cute. <laughs> Brachycephalic syndrome is dogs that have been bred to have a shorter nose and often a shorter skull as well. So although they may look very cute from the outside, inside you've got a whole jumble of tissue and it causes obstruction. Because of the way they look, they have other issues as well. So they have really um, protruding eyes that are very exposed. Particularly pugs, unfortunately, tend to get ulcers or damage to their eyeballs. They also have spinal injuries because they have um, abnormal vertebrae. So it is a whole syndrome. We are the Brachycephalic Obstructive Airway Syndrome Research Group. The area we've been looking at is the respiratory syndrome because I came to this from a surgical point of view and I wanted to see if the surgery worked. The difficulty with this disease is that you could have two dogs that look very similar and one of them will have terrible breathing and the other one might have beautiful breathing. So you can't always look at a dog and say that one is going to be fine and that one isn't. It makes it very difficult for members of the public when they're trying to choose which dog they should you know, have as a pet and love, you know, so it's very difficult. When we ask about do they snore and they oh yeah they snore, they're really cute, and you think no it's not, it's not cute, it's obstruction. So unfortunately some of the things that appeal to the public are signs of disease but they're not recognised as signs of disease. The problem we've had from the beginning is trying to find a way of measuring this that's, that's objective and consistent so that you can measure a dog and then you can come back to the same dog six months later and measure the same dog and know what they're doing. The reason I joined the BOA study group because I, I used to have a bulldog. My bulldog is really severely affected, so I started to do my master here. I mainly develop a diagnostic text for BOAS, totally non-invasive. We don't sedate the dog, we don't take blood, and we just simply put the dog into the chambers, and the chamber will tell us how severe the dog's breathing problem is. The concept of a chamber is that um, it measures the pressure change inside the chamber while the dog is breathing. The pressure change signal will be translated into a number of respiratory parameters like tidal volume, how much air the dog can breathe in, in one breath, or some other indication that may let us know whether the dog have upper airway obstructions and what type of obstruction they have. The different breeds are very different, so the bulldog has got a much bigger head, much heavier neck, and they tend to have problems more in the back of their throat with their soft palate. So they cause obstruction at the back of the throat, and you can hear that. So when the bulldog breathes, you can hear that vibration of the soft palate. So this is one of our affected bulldogs. She's called Ethel, lovely girl, but you can hear that noise. That's the soft palate moving as she breathes. And this girl finds it easier to mouth breathe when she gets at all stressed. She's struggling to breathe a little bit more through her nose. She's got really loud noise at the back of her throat. This girl gets worse when it's hot, so much worse in the summer, and she's exercise intolerant. So this is Daisy. She is a little bit fat, but she has a decent nose there and a quite nice slender head. When she's panting or whether she's nasal breathing, there's very little noise. So there's actually no noise there at all. Her chest movement is quite low and in spite of her weight, she can actually run. Excellent for a bulldog. You've got the French Bulldog where it's often more in the nose, so it's a nostrils that are very, very thin and very narrow. And then behind the nostrils, you've got too much tissue in that nasal cavity. They will have also have a thick palate, but it, it is the nose as well with the Frenchies. 
Cedric here is a lovely French Bulldog that is currently having an exercise tolerance test as part of his functional grading. So as part of the brachycephalic obstructive airway syndrome we like to try and work out how effective these dogs are and we do this by also using this exercise test where we listen to the dogs and their airway before and after a three minute trot test. It's quite a slow test so it's four miles per hour, it's a, it's a nice gentle test for the dogs to do but there are some dogs that will struggle to just do this three minute exercise test. So Cedric has just been for his three minute exercise test. We're going to listen to him again. So things we're looking for is excessive chest movement here, which he doesn't have. We're looking for thoracic movement here at the inlet, which he doesn't have. We listen to the larynx and to the pharyngeal areas to see if there is any increase in the respiratory noise after the exercise. And again, you can hear he's quiet. And then the other thing that's nice with Cedric is that he's breathing through his nose quite easily after the exercise. We also look then how quickly they, they recover from the exercise tolerance test. Nuki is an affected French Bulldog and you can hear his noise. It's mainly on inspiration. We think this noise is related to nasal obstruction and he has quite narrowed nostrils as well, so we grade the nostrils in these dogs. We're also looking at respiratory effort here, and again, he's got more respiratory effort than we saw with Cedric. This is Nuki after exercise. You can see here we've got quite marked inspiratory effort here, so his chest wall is heaving here. His airway noise has noticeably increased after his exercise, and he has some higher pitch noise, which is inspiratory obstruction. Oh boy, I'm gonna let him calm down now. So this is Freddy, he is a male French Bulldog. He's got a nice nose on him and he's got very little noise. He can exercise and he is good in heat. So this is a pretty good French Bulldog. Pugs have a long soft palate. Um, they can have excessive nasal tissue as well, but they also have a larynx which tends to collapse more. So that's the voice box. And in pugs, unfortunately, it tends to, um, instead of opening when they breathe in, it tends to collapse inwards. So actually when they're breathing in and trying to get air in, they have more obstruction then. So this is Gino. Gino is a male pug and he's got pretty good breathing. So he doesn't have excessive thoracic wall movement here. When he's nasal breathing, he's pretty quiet and he can also pant without much noise as well. And he exercises very well. Even when I use a stethoscope, he's got very little airway noise. It would be better if he lost a bit of weight because we know that weight is related to airway. So the fatter the pugs are, the worse their airway is. But otherwise, he's a pretty good dog. Ten years ago, the Kennel Club supported me with the first grant and that paid for the first plasmography chamber. And since then, they've been helping us along the way. So they've bought our other chambers and they've helped with the geneticist work as well. So they've kept funding us, kept helping us with this research. These breeds have increased exponentially over the last 10 years and I think the projection is if the French Bulldog continues in popularity it will be the top registered breed. So now it's become much more relevant this research because the number of dogs affected has become so enormous. When we got Betty she had all those snuffly noises that we thought were really really cute. She was overweight which we again we thought was really cute um, but clearly not. It wasn't helping her at all. She was recommended to have the surgery and breathe tons better. Before the surgery we would take Betty for a walk and we would maybe only get five ten minutes down the road and Betty would be passing out on the floor literally fainting. Looking back now it seems stupid of me but I liked it. I liked her being needy. It felt cute. It felt like, oh, little baby, you know, oh, she's all out of breath. And knowing what I know now, I should have been ashamed of myself then. It was like really bad, but I just would be fr frightened to buy another pug. It was a lot of money we paid for her, and, and, and she's cost us a lot of money. Think carefully. <laughs> We also worked with some geneticists and the reason that's really important is from a surgical point of view I'd rather not operate on these animals. It'd be much better if we can get the genetic tests up and running so we can breed the disease out. So when we started collecting data on these dogs years ago we've been collecting genetic swabs as well and it's looking really promising.
As a geneticist, I felt I might be able to do something. So we set out to see whether we could tease the two apart, flat face and the breathing. And what I would like owners and breeders to help me with is collecting lots of DNA samples and just answering simple questionnaires about their dogs. They can do that through the breed clubs, but in addition, we're about to set up an emailing from the kennel club to known owners of these dogs. And if you get such an email, then please help. Hopefully we can get rid of some of the more severely diseased dogs and the whole population will get healthier. I want to see those breeds have better health and have better quality of life. A lot of vets say there are no good brachycephalic dogs and I think you're wrong because we've seen them and we've documented it, so they are out there. The public appetite for them is enormous, but you have to be careful. You have to go for parents that are health checked. What's really important is looking for dogs that can exercise, that can trot and run out and they can still breathe through their nose. We're looking for very little airway noise, preferably no airway noise, but as little airway noise as possible. And dogs that can tolerate being out in the summer as well. Unfortunately, I didn't see the mum and it was the mum that had the bad breathing with Betty. Um, I only saw her through a window. You need to see the parents and see all the evidence of their health checks. Understand the, the breathing problem of brachycephalic dogs is really important for the owners because some owner might ignore the problem for a long time and letting their dog develop more severe symptoms. When you say, does your dog have airway disease, they'll say, no, it's a pug. No, so even though they're rec documenting the fact they've got all these problems, for them it is still normal for that breed and that's something we're hoping we can find.